So, what's our goal in sailing? Is it to become an expert? I asked the expert question to a friend of mine who used to be a ski instructor after a day on the slopes in which I thought I had probably done pretty well. So am I an expert now, Lars? He said, well, an expert does everything you did today. The difference is that he can do it under all conditions. He can be dropped at the top of a mountain at the six feet of powder. He can ski at night. He can ski in the rain. He can ski the steeps. And that's pretty much a lot to ask for most skiers because the goal for every skier should be to be a confident skier. And only you know whether you're a confident skier or not. And I thought the whole idea was pretty, pretty well applied to sailing because after all, an expert, few of us are ever going to go around Cape Horn. We're probably never going to set a storm trysail in a full gale in our sailing careers. I think the definition of a confident sailor is a sailor who pretty much knows what's going to happen on his own boat before it happens. And the key to knowing that is just thinking ahead. Confidence. So where does it come from? Well, it certainly comes from experience. A oh, bit of a haze out here. We better watch where we're going. But experience isn't everything. There are sailors who have 30 years of experience, and there are sailors who have one year experience 30 times. It's not the same. It's a whole bunch of little things that add up to a sailboat. And it's those little things that a confident sailor has learned to look at almost automatically with his eye. His eye fixes on, oh, the pins that hold things together. For example, that came out pretty easily, didn't it? A good example of me not paying attention. There we are. These little things are very important, as every experienced sailor has learned. If this comes open, which is quite easy, that's not so good. The casual eye of a confident sailor lights frequently on the stuff he may need. For example, the reef line. Okay, the reef line looks good. All of these fittings look pretty good. The most important of all is often overlooked, and that's the stays, the wires that hold up the mast without which, well, we wouldn't have a mast. They're held by pins, simple pins. Easy to take for granted, but. Yeah, well, I think we're going off to Lewin FM, but not much time. I have a friend who was sailing along just like this on a lovely day when he noticed that the pin in his leeward shroud had come out and the shroud was dangling free. He realized all of a sudden that if he were to tack, his mast might fall right over the side. And every time I tell myself that story, it makes me take yet another look at the clevis pins holding the all-important stays on the boat. Continual attention to the little things is so important that for offshore cruisers, it becomes a daily ritual. So it's time for our deck check. Make sure that no chafe is building up on us and that some of the problem areas are holding their own. We'll start up here at the bow and the all important roller furler mechanism these are not backing out. In the past, I had a mysterious break of this roller furler control line. It broke about here, last voyage. And I never could figure out why. It's possible for anchor chain lockers like this one. They're not really watertight. So they rely on a drain in the bow to remove the water that comes in when the bow buries. And it looks like our drain is working. 
there's no water in the anchor chain pan. That's good. This lift for the bridle for the repaired spinnaker pole is a critical thing to check. It can, especially when you furl the sail at night, it can get tangled up and rolled up into the sail, which really would be a big problem. We're down to my third reef, which seems set correctly. I don't see any overwhelming chafe points. These flat turning blocks, they just relead the line of the uh, gear and the mast back to the cockpit and nothing much goes wrong with them. The all important gooseneck fitting, which was modified by me and my friend Russ with with these hefty quarter inch stainless steel plates is holding up well after four years and I have no concerns about that. These blocks all look good. There's no chafe on the sail from the reef points with the reef lines and this tides sail track which is the key that's a proprietary name for an aftermarket sail track which allows which provides very little friction. It allows these sails to be put up and down even when there's a good deal of friction upon them. It's quite stable to stand on a sailboat in this position. If you can lean against the mast and hold on to one of the stays. And uh, with the added support of the tether and the jack line. But still, the critical aspect of moving around a boat, which of course is moving somewhat unpredictably, is to wait for a lull and never give up a handhold. This is the Traveler, which allows us to move the, the uh, attachment point of the main sheet back and forth and I just keep it in the middle and you can see that at some point probably during the night in a rain squall or something a line got caught under this and bent it up it still functions maybe I can bend that down when the time is right we don't want these jack lines to come off I can't find anything wrong. On a self-steering gear with external components, that is all the lines out here connected to a drum on the wheel, you'd be able to see all these chafe points at a glance. The Cape Horn puts everything elegantly below deck, so here we go, once a day. Seems like this is my second home. However, this is the replacement pin we put on, which is solid as a rock, I think. And I have Loctite on all these now. That's a binder for uh, the little machine screws that hold the blocks on so they don't back out under friction. I can visually inspect the pins in those shackles as well. And we're looking for chafe on these control lines. And I don't see any chafe. There's no water down here. The dripless shaft seal is not leaking. There's no water or oil in the back of the engine.
The pedestal looks good. The steering pedestal. I had one of these break in Hawaii eight years ago. So this is the roller furler control line. I've, I've taken to putting a safety hitch on this just so that because it wouldn't be good if you somehow fell down and let that go the whole sail would unfurl. Let's have a look at the quadrant assembly down in there. First of all the lines are appropriately tight adjusted here. Depends on the shackles are holding. The quadrant braces are tight. There's no water down here at all. And the vane is functioning as it should. Deck check complete. Time for breakfast. It's always okay to take over another sailboat to leeward. You don't take their wind. You don't uh, freak them out. And they don't have to alter course. Probably the first thing all sailors learn to do is tack. It's a simple maneuver. And it causes more problems than anybody could ever imagine. Mostly an issue of fouls. No matter how many years an experienced sailor has, to remain confident, he has to pay attention to what he's doing and prepare for things. Kind of a watchword in sailing. Be prepared, separate parachutes. Be your own coast guard. It starts with looking at the lines we're going to use. In this case, we can center the traveler. We check the main sheet to make sure it isn't fouled. I like to throw it down below like that. We look at the working sheet and we take any slack out of the next working sheet. Now I'm confident I can make a tack without a whole bunch of mistakes and having to go up forward and clear the fouls. Alex is a good student and I think her confidence is growing accordingly. Although maybe we should ask her. So on the, on the next tack, when we switch from starboard tack to port tack and go that way, you uh, are going to grind the uh, Genoa all the way in real tight. Okay. Ready about. All right. Have you checked for fouls? Hardly. Hardly. I'll help you by heading up, and then we'll discuss what went wrong. Okay. Look out for that sea lion. He almost took a bite out of our bow. Good. That's fine, honey. Now, the reason that we came out with a big belly in our Genoa that we had to then crank in was yeah. because you were prepared to cast off, but not prepared to haul in. Okay. Let's see what we can do about it this time. Because I didn't have it in my hand? Well, you were looking at the cast off line, which is sort of way secondary. Right, right, right. When you're tacking, it's the new active Genoa sheet that has your attention. Right. And no slack in it and no fouls and right. the right number of turns on the winches. And heartily. 
Okay, you're doing it again. You're paying a lot of attention to that sheet, which doesn't matter. That's the sheet that matters. Let's see how, how that works the next time. Okay. It's the other line that now in, 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 in mid-channel that you want to tend to your other line because right. that's the next active Genoa sheet. So this is fine. We, we wrap it around twice at this point. Twice is, is good, I think, yeah. Okay, Take the, all, all the slack out. All the slack out. Okay. Right. And now this one, I'm just going to dump it. You're going to prepare to cast off. First, you've assured that there are no fouls in the line and it'll run through the blocks. Yes. So, to so get ready it about. Means I'm going to get it in my hand and leave it twice I'll tell you when to dump it. You okay. dump it when it first starts to break and heartily, not yet, heartily. And when it first breaks, Ah, oh, this feels better. This feels much better. And if you're quick, you won't have to winch much. Good. Very nice. The coordination between the helmsman, that's me, and the crew, that's you, so far, is really important. He can screw you. The helmsman can screw you up completely by just turning too fast or not paying attention to what you're doing. But when you get in sync with each other, it's really almost effortless. All right, so now you're the skipper and I'm the crew. Okay. Jiving, ah, the great bugaboo, the terrifying prospect. Jiving is when we change course with the wind behind us, so the boom swings suddenly across the boat. But is it a disaster? No. And you can jibe just like this. And that's all there is to it. And the trick is simply this. When we intentionally jibe, all rigs standing, you continue the turn a little bit into the wind so that the sail is hardly filled at the end of the jibe and then return to course. You can jibe in 30 or 40 knots that way. It's even easier because you probably have in a deep reef Well, here goes that. Boy. Just trying to get it set up downwind with the wind vane. Alright. We'll just jive around and pick it off. You can make an emergency turn with such a jibe when your whisker pole breaks in half and there's no choice but to head suddenly up into the wind in 30 knots and 6 foot seas.
the ocean racing boats I've been on, 60 and 70 footers, jibe that way, or at least they did when traditional spinnakers and bloopers were the rule and the game was dead downwind on one leg of the course. Usually a crew member grabbed the big main sheet and pulled it in a little bit and then as the boom swung over radically, he threw it into the air so it wouldn't foul. But the notion of trying to center the boom or trim it way in, it's okay, especially in light air, but almost certainly unnecessary for most of us. Yes, and then there are accidental jibes. Those jibes when the boom swings unexpectedly over and bonks a crewman on the head or threatens to sweep a child overboard. And you know what? Accidental jibes are preventable. An accidental jibe should never happen. And when an accidental jibe happens, it is one person's fault, and that is the helmsman's fault. And the skipper's fault, perhaps, for not supervising the helmsman. A dead downwind course requires close attention from the helmsman in order to not accidentally jibe. And the simple solution for most of us is to just alter course 10 or 15 degrees to windward, takes all the uncertainty out of where the boom's going to be, and it keeps a sudden puff from what could be a disastrous episode. Confidence? is knowing you're not going to have an accidental jibe. Accidental jibes are not good. There's something interesting about the whole business of reefing. Advanced sailors reef long before intermediate sailors who have just gotten the idea of it. I think mostly because they are used to doing it and they have looked at their gear and fixed up their boat so that reefing is easy. Most of the time on older boats especially, or boats that are unfamiliar, the blocks don't work very well, the sheaves stick, the lines are worn out or the wrong size. The whole reefing procedure is not only challenging but irritating and so people don't want to do it. Can you reef in five minutes? Should be able to. I can, sometimes. The truth is that most of the time when we have to reef, we've waited a little too long. The boat's banging around and practice really pays off then. So it's only blowing 17. on a straight line on a beam reach. We can probably adjust the sails better, but basically, sailing in waves, uh, you want to go in a straight line, takes a certain amount of effort from the helmsman. Well, let's put it in the reef just for the fun of it, and it'll certainly make uh, the rest of the steering easier, right? Yeah. The first thing I do before reefing, with slab reefing, is to assure myself that this line here, which is the first reef, the blue one, is, is correctly positioned on the boom, which it sort of is, that's fine. That's the second reef that goes up to the higher. We won't be using that one, just the first reef. What's going to happen is that the sail is going to go down from to the first reef, which is this line of Pringles across the belly of the sail. And out forward, you can see be a downhaul, the first downhaul, there's the second reef downhaul, we won't be using the first reef downhaul. So the sequence of this is going to be slack off the main sheet so that the sail lofts, then we're going to lower the sail using the main halyard, then we're going to pull down the downhaul number one, which is here on the deck, then we're going to pull down and crank in reef number one, which is the blue line over there. And when we've done those four things, we should have a reef to sail. It's hard to keep your footing when the boat's doing this. So what you do is to slow everything down. There's no rush. It's a beautiful day. 
We'll take this in stages. If something doesn't work out just right, we'll just fix it. But one thing we'll make sure we don't do is allow ourselves any obvious fouls that we could have stopped by thinking a little bit ahead. And of course, by putting in a reef, we'll automatically solve the problem of the scalloped loft. Make sense? Makes sense. Confidence is certainly good to have and absolutely necessary, but it's also necessary to know when not to have confidence. And I do not have confidence in man overboard retrieval, especially for a single hander or a family in which only one or maybe two of the people on board is really adept at sailing maneuvers. I was out sailing alone in 30 knots when that cockpit cover last to the port bow came off do you know that after five passes i never could retrieve it and afterwards i walked dockweiler beach to leeward of where it had come off for two hours in vain looking for it with the prospect always in mind that if this had been a dog it would not have been retrieved 20 years ago a colleague of mine was sailing back from catalina with his family in a 30-foot sailboat he fell overboard they could not retrieve him and he drowned on that same course the benign 30 mile distance that people sail every day a single-handed sailor, a member of my organization, was returning from a race in Catalina, fell overboard, and drowned. In 60 years, nobody's ever fallen off one of my sailboats, including me. I think it's entirely possible to expect that. Life jackets are a matter of choice, an important one, I think. You may notice that I don't wear one because when I'm sailing alone, I prefer to have a safety harness that I can clip on to these permanently installed jack lines on the deck and have a good feeling of security in case I have to lean over the side to do something. But with children, depending on their age, I feel advanced sailors are wised up to the usefulness of life jackets and this is a personal more than a policy issue that under normal conditions people in the cockpit don't have to wear any kind of safety gear on a boat like this 38 foot long boat that's quite stable they're not going to fall overboard from sitting drinking a, a cocktail but children are a different matter and my rule is the kids may want to listen, but they don't remember for more than six minutes what they agreed to. On this boat, if a child goes forward and doesn't hold on with at least one hand all the time, he has to come back to the cockpit. One error means you are removed from the bow and must sit with the smelly old people. It seems to work. I don't think you could strap kids in the way I strap myself in. I think they need to have life jackets on under any kind of conditions that are threatening. And that it's our responsibility as skippers. Make sure they don't come anywhere near falling overboard, which, let's face it, 
is a highly undesirable prospect on any sailboat. Now let's see what happens when my personal flotation device, my retrieval gear, the famous life sling, is just tossed overboard on a day when it's blowing, at the moment, eight knots. And overboard. I have not looked at this in a year. Let's see if it goes out without fouling. We'll just do a crash, a two knot crash tack. Because after all, a single hander doesn't have much choice. There isn't time for me to lower sails, start the engine at this point. I'm just gonna have to hope that this helps. The idea of the life sling is that it puts a line in the water, a floating polypropylene line, that the boat can be maneuvered such that the victim can grab onto the line and thereby pull himself up to the flotation and put it around himself where he can be winched in or hauled in by hand while the boat is stopped, which in this case we would just do by heading up into the wind. And then I guess since I'm alone, I would bring us up on a luffing course just to maintain the smallest amount of steerage way. Are you all right out there, George? I hope so. Right, well, George weighs 250 pounds, none of which is in this life sling. And overboard drills are important. It's important to study them. There's a lot on the internet about it. There are books written that requires practice. You're supposed to start the engine during the course of events. If you are alone or double-handed, which is a couple sailing the boat, you will be effectively single-handed too. Keep the people on the boat. It's easier than retrieving them. Well, I see we're back in the mist again. In fact, I can't see the shoreline. And in the days before GPS, that would be an issue. I would go below, make a mark on the paper chart, use a course protractor, make a line toward the next channel marker and hope we found it today with GPS it's just a glance at the dial we always know exactly where we are and that gives confidence well Another sailing day completed and I hope I have learned something. You know, we've been talking mostly about risk management and it isn't a joke, but there are jokes. One of them is something we've all experienced, which is to be sailing along and observe next to you a 45 foot gold plater with seven people on board who'd sip their cocktails and wave gaily hello. And on her side, hang four fenders, some of them trailing in the water. A scandalized look, if there ever was one, causing titters all over the waterway. But it's more than that. It means something. It means that the helmsman, who's responsible, doesn't know what's hanging over his side. He, has, he can't see them. And he hasn't noticed the knots along the gunnels that hold them. He's oblivious to his own situation, which is not so good. This happens again and again, and we can all learn from it. 
A few years ago, a crew of four set off in a husky boat for the Hawaiian Islands here from Southern California. And after three days, they turned back because their water maker broke. The water maker is a sophisticated device that turns seawater into drinking water. It's expensive and it can break. Nobody goes on a 2,500 mile sea voyage without an emergency supply of water in case the water maker breaks. Well, you could say that crew didn't have a crystal ball. Well, they didn't need a crystal ball. They just needed to have thought it through a little more. You know, we don't get to go sailing every day, or at least I don't. But we can go sailing all the time, and I advocate it. I think that a confident sailor sails just before he falls asleep at night when he turns off the reading light. I think he sails on the way to business meetings. As the scenarios tick over in his mind, he rehearses what has happened to him and plans to learn from it. And even while riding his bicycle, which, by the way, is 10 times more dangerous than recreational cruising boat sailing ever was. So, the confident sailor is us. And on a personal note, you know, this marks uh, about 10 years of the sailing channel Christian Williams Yachting, as formerly called, that I've been able to present without the benefit of ding-dong bells asking for subscriptions or Patreon support. The channel has sold a lot of books. It's made several of my sailing books bestsellers, for which I feel nothing but gratitude, admiration for you all, and somewhat surprise. So on behalf of this channel, thanks for coming along, and see you out there.